stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. so they probably were like, oh my. <laughs> Thank you. No. <laughs> Welcome. I'm so happy to see all of you at our last performance of Thornton Wilder's Our Tent. Now, some of you are here because you love the play Our Tent. And some of you are here because you just want to support community theater. We thank you for that. And some of you are friends and family of some of the cast and crew, and they made you come. <laughs> It doesn't really matter the fact is that you're here. Thornton Wilder, he wrote this play in 1938. This play changed everything for theater. This was the first time that audience had seen there's no curtain, there's very little scenery, there's a lot of pantomime going on, and we have actors who now start talking to the audience and going back and forth. Believe it or not, this just didn't happen before 1938. Our town was the most performed play of the 20th century. And in the 21st century, it is playing somewhere in the world every single day. Can you imagine Japan, China, Russia? And when you see this play, imagine the cultural changes they would have to make. We stuck very closely to Thornton Wilder's script, the way he wrote it. We did make a few changes to more correctly reflect family structure today. So for those of you who, who know our town, let's see if you notice that. For me, it's a sentimental journey. I am the director of the show. I played Emily in high school, and now I'm directing it, so I represent Thornton Wilder said, you're born, you make some decisions, whoops, you're 70. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's how it works. And it doesn't matter where you live, or what your beliefs are, or whatever, what you're going to see tonight, this is what connects us all together. So, I want you to enjoy this evening. We're going to have uh, two intermissions, and I think if you don't know where the bathrooms are, the men's are back there and the women's are around the corner. If you have your cell phones on, please turn them off. Okay, that's enough for me. I'm going to let you take over. This play is called Our uh, Town, written by Paul Plaza. Uh, it takes place in Grover's Corners. New Hampshire, just across the Massachusetts line. Latitude, 42 degrees, 40 minutes. Longitude, 70 degrees, 37 minutes. The first act shows a day in our town. That day being May 7, 1901, the time just before dawn. Sky is beginning to show some streaks of light in the east there, just beyond our mountain. That morning star always looks so wonderful bright before it burns out, don't it? Well, I suppose I'd better tell you how our town lies. This here's Main Street. Over there's a railway station. Tracks run that way. Polish town is across the tracks and some kind of families. Over there is the Congregational Church. Across the street is the Presbyterian. Methodist and Unitarian over there. Baptist is way down over the holler by the river. Catholic church is way down yonder over by the tracks. <laughs> Up here's the uh, town hall and post office combined. Jail's in the basement. William Jennings Bryan wants to deliver the speech right off these very steps. Up here's a row of shops, a uh, kitchen post and horse blocks in front of them. Uh, first automobile is going to come around in about five years. Belong to uh, Ben Cartwright. He's our richest citizen. Lives up in the big white house up there on the hill. Up here is the grocery store and Mr. Morgan's drugstore. Most everybody in town comes and looks into these stores at least once a day. Public school is over yonder. High school is further down. Quarter nine mornings, noon time, and three o'clock in the afternoon, the whole town can hear the yelling and screaming from those two schoolyards. 
Up here is a uh, doctor's house. Doc is. That's his back door. There's some scenery for those of you who think they need scenery. Over here is Mrs. Gibbs' garden. Corn, peas, beans, hollyhock, heliotrope, and a lot of burdock. In those days, our town newspaper came out twice a week, the Grover's Honor Sentinel. Over there is uh, editor Myrtle Webb's house. There's uh, Mrs. Webb's garden. It's the same as Miss Gibbs, except it has a lot of sunflowers, too. Nice little town, you know what I mean. Nobody remarkable ever came out of it, as far as anyone you know. The earliest tombstones up there on the mountain say uh, 1670, 1680, there. Gibbses and Cartwrights and Hershey's and Grover's. Same names as there are here now. Well, as I said, it's uh, just before dawn. The only lights on in town are in a cottage where a Polish mother has just had twins and at the Joe Crowell house where Joe Jr. is getting up so as to deliver the morning paper. And at the depot where Shorty Hawkins is uh, just flagging down the 545 for Boston. <laughs> Naturally, in the country, all around, in fact, there have been lights on for some time, what with Milton's and so on. But townspeople like to sleep late. So, another day's begun. Oh, there's Doc Gibbs coming down Main Street, coming back from that baby case. Oh, and here's his wife coming downstairs to make morning breakfast. Doc Gibbs died in 1930. New Hospital is named after him. Mrs. Gibbs died before that, a long time ago, in fact. She went to visit her daughter, Rebecca, who married an insurance man in Canton, Ohio, and died there. Pneumonia. But they brought her body back here, and now she's up there on the mountain, along with a whole mess of Gibbses and Hurseys. She was Julia Hersey before she married Doc Gibbs in the Congregational Church there. In our town, we like to know the facts about everybody. <laughs> oh, here comes Mrs. Webb, getting ready to get her breakfast, too. Miss Doc Gibbs got that call about half past one this morning. And uh, there's Joe Crowell Jr. delivering the morning paper. Good morning, Doc Gibbs. Good morning, Joe. Has somebody been sick, Doc? No, just a pair of twins born over in Polish town. Would you like your paper now? I'll take it, thank you. Any special news, uh, local or around the world since Wednesday? Yes, sir. My teacher, Miss Foster, is getting married over to a fellow over in Concord. What do you boys think about that? Well, it's not my business, but I think if a person starts out to be a teacher, she ought to stay one. <laughs> By the way, how's that name you're doing, Joel? Fine, Doc. Never think about it at all. Only like you said, it always tells me when it's going to rain. What's it telling you today? Is it going to rain? No, sir. You sure? Yes, sir. You ever make a mistake? No, sir. Okay, no. <laughs> I want to tell you something about that Joe Crowell boy again. Joe was awful bright. Graduated high school here, yeah, head of his class. So he got a scholarship to Massachusetts Tech, where he graduated head of his class there, too. It was all wrote up in the Boston paper at the time. He was going to be a great engineer, Joe was. But then the war broke out, and he died in France. All that education would come up. Give you up there, see? Howie Newsom, deliver the mail. What's the matter with you today? Uh, morning, Doc. Good morning, Howie. <laughs> Somebody sick? No, just a pair of twins, born of Mrs. Grabolowski. Oh, twins, eh? Yeah. This town keeps getting bigger every year. Yep. Gonna rain today, Holly? Oh, no, no. Fine day. That'll burn through. Come on, Bessie. Oh, hello, Bessie. How old is she now, Howie? Well, it's going on 17 years. Bessie's been all mixed up ever since the Lockhart stopped taking their quart of milk every day. She wants to leave them one just the same. <laughs> been scolding me the whole way. <laughs> Good morning, Howie. Good morning, Mrs. Gibbs. The doc's just coming down the street. Is he? Huh? Seems like you're a little late today. Yes, ma'am. Something went wrong with the separator. Don't know what it was. Doc? Oh, Children, yeah. time to get up. Charge! Rebecca! Come on, Bessie! <laughs> Everything all right, Frank? Oh, yes, I declare. Easy as kittens. Hey, 
cake, it'll be ready in a minute. Uh, maybe if you can catch a couple hours of sleep this morning. Okay. Sit well, down and have your coffee. See, Mrs. Wentworth's due to come in about 11 o'clock. Uh, I think I know what the problem is there. Her day, what it ought to be. Uh, all told, you won't get more than about three hours sleep. I don't know what's to become of you, Frank. I really wish I could get you to take a nice rest and change. It would do you good. Emily, it's 7 o'clock. It's time to get up. I declare, Frank, you have got to talk to George. I don't know what's come over that boy lately, but he is no help to me at all. I can't even get him to chop me some wood. Is he getting sassy to you? Oh, no. He just whines. That Baseball is all he thinks about. George! Rebecca, get down here! George! George, what's sharp? Yes, Pa. Hon, I think I'm going to go upstairs and uh, maybe give me 40 winks. Looks Emily, hard. you'll be late for school. You wash yourself good, I'll come up and do it mess out. Ma! What dress shall I wear? Hush, your father's been out all night, needs his rest. I ironed one and put it for you on your bed. Ma, I hate that dress! Oh, hush up with you. <laughs> Every day, I go to school dressed like a sick turkey. <laughs> now, Rebecca, you always look real nice. Mama, George is drawing so bad at me. I am going to come out there and slap both of you silly, I will. Well, we got a factory in our town too. You hear the whistle? Makes blankets. Caught right. Buy it from the fortune. Oh, now, Emily, I will not have it. Breakfast is just as good as any other meal, and I will not have you gobbling like a wolf. It will send your throat. That is a fact. Well, we'll call Put it. away your book, Emily. Mama, by 10 o'clock, I need to know all about Canada. Emily, you know the rules as well as I do. No books at the table. As for me, I would rather my children be healthy than bright. Mama, I both of you know I am. I'm one of the brightest girls in school. I am a wonderful mother. Eat your breakfast. Well, I will speak to your father after he's had some rest, but it seems to me 25 cents a week is enough for a boy your age. I declare I don't know what you spend it all on. Oh, man. I got a lot of stuff to buy. Strawberry phosphates, that's what you spend it on. Well, I don't see how Rebecca comes to have so much money. She has more than a dollar. I've been saving it up gradually. Well, it seems to me, dear, you could spend a bit now and then. Mom, do you know what I love most in the world? Do you? Money. Mom, I'm going to Bye, Mama. Stand up straight, Emily. What about if you don't have to run? Give Miss Boston my best regards. Can you remember that? Yes, Ma. You look real nice, Rebecca. Pick up your feet. Goodbye. Here, chick, 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 Who are you? You are not one of mine. Shoo, shoo. Oh, don't be so scared. Nobody's got to hurt you. Go catch it. Well, good morning, Myrtle. How's the cold? Oh, well, let's look at that tickling feeling in my throat. I told Catherine I didn't know if I'd go to fire practice tonight. I wouldn't be much use. Well, have you tried singing over the cold? Oh, yes, but somehow I can't do that and stay on the key. Well, I thought while I'm resting myself, I'd string up some of these beans. Oh, well, let me help you with those beans. they <laughs> good this year. I'll put up 40 quarts if it kills me. Emily says she hates them, but I noticed she's able to get them down all winter. <laughs> Myrtle, I've got something to tell you because if I don't tell somebody, I am going to burst. Why, Julia, give. <laughs> Myrtle, did that second hand furniture dealer from Boston come by and see you on Friday? No. Well, it came by me. First I thought, it was a patient of the doctors wanted to see me. And he wormed his way into my parlor, and Myrtle, well, he offered me 
$150 for Grandma Wentworth's high boy as I'm sitting here. Oh, why, Julian Gibbs? We did that old thing. Why, it's so big I didn't know what to do with it. I was fixing to give it to Cousin and Esther Wilco. Oh, well, you're going to take it, aren't you? You don't know. $350? What has come over you? Well, if I could get the doctor to use that money to take me on a real vacation somewhere, well, I'd sell it like that. Oh, Myrtle, it has been a dream of mine to see Paris friends. Oh, Julia. Oh. I know it sounds crazy, but I always just sort of promised myself if I ever got the chance. Oh, well, how does the doctor feel about it? I'd be around the bush a little bit, I'd say, if I ever got a legacy, that's how I put it. I'd make him take me somewhere. You no. Know, what did he say? Oh, you know him. Haven't heard a straight word out of him in all the time I've known him. No, he said it would make him feel discontented with Grover's Carnage to go tracing all over Europe. Better left well enough alone, he said. But every two years, he makes a trip to the battlefields of the Civil War. That's enough treat for anyone, he says. <laughs> well, Catherine just admires the way that Dr. Gibbs knows everything about the Civil War. She's a good mind to give up Napoleon and move over to the Civil War, only Dr. Gibbs, being one of the greatest experts in the country, just makes her despair. <laughs> It's a fact he's never so happy as when he's at Antietam or Gettysburg. Oh, Merck, the times we've walked over those hills, pausing every bush, pacing it all out like we were going to buy the place. <laughs> well, if that second-hand man's really serious about buying it, Julia, then you sell it, and then you'll get to see Paris all right. So just keep dropping hints from time to time. That's how it got to be in the ocean, you know. Oh, I'm sorry I even mentioned it. It just seems to me that once in your life before you die, you ought to visit a place where they don't talk in English and don't even want to. <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies. I'm going to have to interrupt you right now. We'd like to get a little more information about the town. Kind of a scientific account. So, we've asked uh, a professor from our local university to uh, sketch in a few of the details of the history of man here. Professor Willard, is Professor Willard here? Oh, Professor, please come right on. Uh, may I introduce Professor Willard? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> professor, a few brief notes about the... Uh, history of the town here. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid we're limited on time. Uh, 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 Grover's Corners, uh, let me see, um, uh, Grover's Corners lies on the old Pleistocene granite of the Appalachian Range. I may say this is some of the oldest land in the world. We're very proud of that here. Of course, there are more recent outcroppings. Sandstone showing through a shelf of Devonian basalt and vestiges of Mesozoic shell. Of course, these are comparatively new, perhaps two or three hundred million years. Some highly interesting fossils have been found, I may say unique fossils, two miles north of Beckham's farm in Sinus Beckham's cow patch. These may be seen at the university in the museum at any time. That is, any reasonable time. Uh, shall I read some of Professor Gruber's notes on the mineralogical situation? Me Precipitation, etc. I'm afraid we don't have time for that, Professor. But we would like to have a little bit about the uh, past history of man here. Oh, <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Anthropological data. Early Amerindian stock. Catahatchee tribes. No evidence before the 10th century of this era now entirely disappeared. Oh, possible traces in three families. 
Migration in the early part of the 17th century of English brachiocephalic blue-eyed stock. Since then, some Slav and Mediterranean and and the population, Professor. <clears throat> Within the town limits, 2,640. Uh, just a moment, Professor. Ah, yes, indeed. <laughs> the population at the moment is 2,642. The postal district brings in another 507 more, making the total 3,149. Mortality, birth rates constant by McPherson's gauge, 6.032. Thank you so very much, Professor. We are so obliged that you came down here. Not at all, sir. Not at all. Uh, Professor, Professor Bud. Professor Bud. That way. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Not at all, sir. Not at all. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm now the uh, political and social component. <laughs> Editor Webb. Uh, Editor Webb? Oh, she'll be here in a minute. She just cut her hand while she was eating an apple. Oh, thank you so much, Mrs. <laughs> Catherine, everybody's waiting. After the passing of Charles Webb, uh, his sister Catherine took over as uh, editor and publisher of the Grover's Corner Sentinel. That's our local paper, you know. Well, I don't have to tell you that we're run by a board of selectmen. Here, all males vote at the age of 21. Women vote indirectly. <laughs> we're low middle class with a sprinkling of professional men and 10% uh, illiterate laborers. Politically, we are 85% Republican, 10% Democrat, 2% socialist, the rest indifferent. <laughs> Religiously, we are 86% Protestant, 12% Catholic, and the rest indifferent. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Is it a We're quite an ordinary town, if I say so myself. A little better behaved than most. <laughs> Probably a lot taller. But the young folks seem to like it well enough. 90% of them graduating high school settle down right here to live, even those who've been away to college. Is there anyone that would like to ask Editor Webb? Yes, ma'am. Uh, is there much drinking in Grover's Corners? Well, ma'am, I don't know what you mean by much. Uh, Saturday night, the farm hands like to meet down at Ellery Green Hour's barn and holler some. We do have one or two town drums. We always seem to have remorses every time the evangelists come to town. No, liquor isn't much here in the home, except to force in the medicine chest. Right, good for snake bite, always has been. Is there anyone in town that's aware of Excuse the... Excuse me, could you please come forward? We, we can't quite hear you. Is there anyone in town aware of the social injustice and industrial inequality? No. Oh. Yes, yes, everybody is something terrible. But we spend a good deal of our time talking about who's rich and who's poor. Why don't they do something about it then? I, I don't know. It seems like you're all hunting like everybody for a way for the hard-working and the diligent to rise to the top and the lazy and poor some to fall to the bottom. But it isn't easy. In the meantime, we do what we can to help those who can't help themselves, and the ones who can, why, we should just leave them alone. Uh, uh, are there any more questions? Oh, Editor Webb, Editor Webb, is there any culture and love of beauty in Grover's Corner? No, ma'am, there isn't much culture here. <laughs> Not in the sense that you mean. Oh, well, come to think of it, there are a couple of girls down at the local high school that play for commencement, but I don't think they like it very much. No, ma'am, there isn't much. But perhaps this is a time for me to tell you about some of the pleasures we do have. I like to watch the sun come up over the mountains in the morning, and we oh, know a good deal about the birds. I watch the changes in the seasons. Well, everybody knows about that. <clears throat> but those other things, no. Oh, 
Robinson Crusoe, the Bible, Handel's Lager, we know about those. Oh, 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 and Whistler's Mother, but that's about as far as we go. So I thought, thank you, Editor Webb. Thank you so much, Edward. Now we'll get back to the town. All our 2,642 have had their dinners, and all the dishes have been washed. There's an early afternoon calm in our town, kind of a buzzing and a humming coming from the schoolyard. Uh, there's a few buggies on Main Street, horses dozing at the hitching post. What do you know what it's like? Doc Gibbs is up in his office tapping people and making them say, aw, and then, oh, 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 Louise, I can't. I have to go home and help my mother. I promise. Goodbye. Emily, walk simply now. What do you think you ought to do? Oh, Auntie, you're terrible. One moment you're telling me to stand up straight, the next moment you're calling me names. I just don't listen to you. Oh. Gosh, I've never been kissed by such a great lady before. Excuse me, Mrs. Forrest. People rush into the field and play, young man. You've got no business playing baseball in the middle of Main Street. Awfully sorry, Mrs. Forrest. Hello, Emily. Oh, hello. Awful fine speech you made in class today. Oh, but thank you. I was prepared to do a speech on the Monroe Doctrine. But the last minute, Miss Corcoran made me talk about the Louisiana Purchase instead. Oh, I worked awfully hard on both, though. Gee, uh, it's funny, Emily. From my window up there, I could just look over and see a study lights while you're doing your homework over in your room. Oh, why can you? I'm sure you stick to it, Emily. I don't see how you can sit still for that long. I guess you must really like school. I just feel it's something we all have to go through. Yeah. I don't mind it, really. It passes the time. Say, Emily, what do you think? Maybe we can kind of set up a telegraph for Mom whenever you want, and you can give me a hint or two on one of those algebra problems. I don't mean the answers, Emily. I, I just need a hint. Well, I think uh, hints are allowed, George. So if you ever get stuck on a question or anything, just whistle up to me in my window, and I'll give you some hints. And you're just naturally bright, I guess. I just figured it's my son of a civil, George. <coughs> well, you see, I, I want to be a farmer, and Mommy Lou says whenever I'm ready, I can start working on this farm, and if I'm any good, I can just be gradually have it. You mean the house and everything? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, better get going back to the baseball field, and thanks for the talk, Emily. Good afternoon, Mrs. Webb. Good afternoon, George. So long, Emily. So long, George. Emily, come and help me string these beans for the winter. <clears throat> Why, that George Gibbs let himself have a real conversation, didn't he? Why, he's growing up. How old might George be? Well, I don't know. Well, let's see, he's about uh, 16. Mama, I made an awfully great speech in class today. Oh, you must recite it to your aunt at supper. What was it about? The Louisiana Purchase. Look up at school, Mama. I've been doing speeches my entire life. Mama, are these big enough? Uh, try and get them a little bigger if you can. Mama, will you answer me a question serious? Oh, seriously, dear. Not serious. Seriously, will you? Of course I will. Mama, am I good looking? <laughs> yes, of course you are. Any child of mine would have good features. I'd be ashamed if they hadn't. <laughs> well, that's not what I mean. What I mean is, am I pretty? I've already told you, yes. Now, that's enough of that. You have such a nice, young, pretty face. I've never heard of such foolishness. Mama, you never tell us the truth about anything. I am telling you the truth. Mama, were you pretty? Why, yes, I was, if I do say it. Oh. <laughs> I was the prettiest girl in town next to Mamie Cartwright. <laughs> Mama, you have to say something about me. Am I pretty enough for anyone to notice me, or, I mean, for anybody to be interested in me? Oh, Emily, stop it. You make me tired. Now, you are pretty enough for all normal purposes. 
<laughs> now, come along now and bring that bowl with you. Uh, uh, Mama, you, you're no help at all. That'll do, that'll do. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Mrs. Webb. I think this is a good time to tell you that the uh, Cartwright Industries have begun building a new bank here in Grover's Corners. They had to go to Vermont for the marble, sorry to say. And they asked a friend of mine what to put in the cornerstone that folks could dig up a thousand years from now. Of course, they're putting in a copy of the New York Times and a copy of the Grover's Corner Sentinel. You see, we're interested in this because some scientific fellas have found a way of painting all that green matter with a kind of glue, a, a, a silicate glue that would keep for a, a thousand, two thousand years. But they're putting in the Bible and the Constitution of the United States, and, and a copy of William Shakespeare's plays. But what do you say, folks? What do you think? You know, Babylon once had two million people in it, and the only thing we know about them is the, is the names of some of the kings, and the wheat contracts, and, and the contracts of the sale of slaves. But every single night, those families sat down to supper. The father come home from his work, the smoke went up the chimney, same as here. And even in Greece and Rome, the only thing we know about the real life of the people is the things that we could piece together out of the joking poems and the comedies they wrote for the theater back then. So, I'm going to have a copy of this play put into the calm stone for people to dig up a thousand years from now. So they'll be able to know a few simple facts about how we were and the way we lived, more than the Treaty of Versailles or the Lindbergh Flight. You see what I mean? So, people a thousand years from now, this is how we were in the provinces north of New York at the beginning of the 20th century. This is how we were in our growing up and in our marrying and in our living and in our dying. Let's be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. A fellowship of kindred minds is mine to that above. Well, a great deal of time has gone by. You can hear the uh, choir practicing down at the Congregational Church. The children are at home doing their schoolwork. The day is running down like a tired clock. Now, look here, everybody. The music came into this world to give pleasure. When it's loud, yelly loudness of the Methodists. <laughs> you couldn't beat them even if you want to. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Emily. Oh, hello, George. Hello. Oh. Why, isn't the moonlight terrible? You can hardly work at all. Emily. Have we gotten to the third problem? I'm sorry, George, which? The third. <laughs> well, yes, George. That's the easiest of them all. Uh, I don't see it, Emily. Can I get a hint? I'll give you one hint. The answer is in yards. In yards? How do you mean? In square yards. Oh, in square yards. Yes, George, don't you see? Yeah. 
<laughs> square yards of wallpaper. <laughs> oh, of wallpaper. I see, I see. Thanks a lot, Emily. You're welcome, George. Hi. Is the mood like terrible? And with choir practice going on? I bet if we hold our breath, we can hear the train all the way to Kantuku. Hear it? What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, might as well try to get back to work. Good night, Emily, and thanks. You're welcome, George. Before I forget, uh, how many of you can be here next Tuesday uh, for Fred Hersey's wedding? Raise your hand. Oh, very good. Oh, that'll be very nice. Uh, oh, we're gonna uh, sing the same music we did last month at uh, James Trowbridge's. Oh, uh, right now we'll sing uh, "Art Thou Weary, Art Thou Lang." It, it's a question, ladies. Make it talk. So, uh, uh, oh, here's a handkerchief, Joe. Where's your hand back? Oh, you can keep it. <laughs> uh, George, you know, I've decided I'm going to raise your allowance 25 cents a week. Not, of course, because you're going to chop bread for your mother. Because you're going to do that as a favor to her. But you're actually, you're getting older now, and I figured you'll have some reason to use it. Thanks, Bob. Let's see, tomorrow's your payday. Okay, you can count on it. I suppose Rebecca's probably going to want a little bit more now, too. So, so. I wonder where your mother could be. She hasn't been this late before. Our practice has never lasted this long. I don't see her there. I don't know where she's at. It's only half past eight, Bob. Oh, I don't know why she's in that old choir anyway. She hasn't got the voice of an old crow. <laughs> and yet, She's traipsed around the streets late at night like this. Well, George, I think it's time you retired, would you? Yes, Bob. Okay. Good night, Norma. Good night. Oh, 
nice to follow the choir practice tonight, wasn't it, ladies? Look at that. Potato weather for sure. Naturally, I didn't want to say a word about it in front of those others. But now we're alone, really. It's the worst scandal there ever was in this town. What? Simone Stimson. Oh, Luella. Uh, but Julia, to have the organist of a church drink and drunk year after year. You know she was drunk tonight. Now, Luella, we all know about Simone. We all know the problems she's had. And Pastor Ferguson knows as well. And it seems to me, if he's willing to keep her on in the church with all that, well, then all we can do is just uh, not to notice it. Not to notice it? But it's getting worse. No, it isn't, Luella. It's getting better. I've been in that choir twice as long as you have, and it hasn't happened anywhere near as often. Oh, my. I hate to go to bed on a night like this. Well, I better go. That child will be sitting up all hours. Good night, Good night. Good night. Can you get home all right, Luella? It's as bright as day. I think I can see Mr. Soames scowling at the window now. Do <laughs> you think we've been to a dance the way the men folk carry on? Good night. Well, we had a real nice time tonight, Fred. You're late enough. Oh, take any later than usual. Well, what'd you have to gossip about tonight? Oh, don't be grouchy, Frank. Come outside with me and smell the heliotrope in the moonlight. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. What'd you do while I was gone? Oh, I was, uh... Read my book as usual. Uh, what'd you have to gossip about tonight? Oh, let me tell you, Frank, there is something to gossip about. <laughs> Simone Stimson, far gone, was she? Oh, worst I've seen her. How that'll end, Frank, I don't know. The pastor can't keep forgiving her forever. Oh, I guess I know more about Simone Stimson's life than anybody else in this town. I don't know. Some people just ain't made for small town life. I don't know where this is going to lead to, but, uh, well, that's, of course, none of our business. Uh, but we should come on and get going inside. Oh, not here. yet. Not yet, Frank. You know, I'm uh, worried about you. Well, what are you worried about? Well, it seems like it's my duty as your wife to make sure that you get a real rest and vacation. And if I get my legacy, I'm going to see to it. Now, Julia, we've talked about this before, and we're going to have to go through that again. Great, you are being unreasonable. Now, Julia, you're going to catch your death of cold out of here. Come on, it's time to go in. By the way, I gave George a piece of my mind tonight. I think he'll be chopping wood for you for a while, anyhow. No, 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 come on, let's go. Let's go oh, again. There's always so much to pick up around here. Frank, do you know that Ms. Fairchild always locks her door every night? All those people that side of town do. That's because they're getting citified, and yet they haven't got anything fit to burgle in the first place. Oh. Get out, Rebecca! There's only room for one at this window. You're always ruining everything. Well, let me look just a minute. Use your own window. I did, but there's no moon there. <laughs> George, do you know what I think? Do you? I think that the moon's getting nearer and nearer, and one day there'll be a big explosion. Rebecca, you don't know anything. <laughs> the moon will get near. All the guys that stay up all night with the telescopes would see it, and they tell about it first. We hear it in the newspapers. George, is the moon shining on South America, Canada, and half the whole world? Well, probably is. 9.30. Most of the lights are out. Oh no, there's a constable warren checking all the doors on Main Street. Oh, and there's Editor Webb after putting her newspaper to bed. Why, good evening, Bill. Well, good evening, Editor Webb. Oh. Why the moon tonight? <laughs> yeah. 
Any trouble here? Well, I saw a small Simpson running around a little bit. Then I saw her husband trying to find her. Oh. <laughs> there she is now. Good evening, Simone. <laughs> Town seemed to settle down for tonight. Good evening, Simone. Town seemed to settle down for the night. Uh, don't, don't you think we should do the same? Can I walk with you a ways? Good night, Simone. I don't know how that thing's going to end, ma'am. She's seen a peck of trouble one after the other. If you see the boys on the baseball team smoking cigarettes, would you have a word with them, please? Leave an awful lot of people. Well, I don't think they smoke cigarettes, man. These ways no more than two, three a year. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> Good night, Bill. Who's that up there? Is that you, Myrtle? Uh, no, it's just me, Auntie. Why aren't you in bed? I don't know. I, I just couldn't sleep yet. But my, isn't the moonlight wonderful? This is Gibbs heliotropes. Do you smell them? Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, not having any trouble, are you, Emily? Troubles? No, Auntie. Enjoy yourself. But don't let your mother catch you. Good night, Emily. <laughs> Good night, Auntie. I never told you about that letter Jean Crawford got from her minister when she was sick. He wrote her a letter, and on the envelope it said, Jane Crawford, The Crawford Farm, Brower's Corners, Sutton County, New Hampshire, the United States of America. What's funny about that? But listen, it's not finished yet. <laughs> the United States of America, continent of North America, the Western Hemisphere, the Earth, the solar system, the universe, the mind of God, and that's what you know? And the postman wrote it just the same. What do you know? Well, that's the end of the first act, folks. <laughs> Ten minute intermission, there's some refreshments in the back. <laughs>